So this is my production of entropy. All the terms that go in here. I have a time rate of change of temperature that multiplies the combination of change of free energy, Helmholtz uh, energy with temperature and uh, uh, in internal uh, entropy density function. And because I have one single temperature, I get this for all phases. By the way, one thing I didn't uh, include here, I forgot to mention, I am having immiscible phases, let's say water and air and solid, but I have not modeled air-water interfaces as a separate entity, which I did previously. Uh, I thought, okay, if, okay, if you're not happy with this uh, length of the inequality, you are welcome to do that. So, but you could do that, and it would be actually interesting to see what I do. The very first line, the very first equation, you have two two sigmas. Is it like for layers and then phases? Yes, correct. So actually, I had two layers here. I forgot to say, I have written this now for. I am developing this only for two layers, because basically it doesn't matter. Once I, what I'm after is. That's the only thing we talked about it earlier. Is in these exchange terms, how should the exchange of mass between layer one and two be modeled? And can I get, of course I can come up myself in, in the groundwater flow, we say it's the head difference. Hydraulic head difference uh, times uh, resistivity. I can use that. But can I get some hint from the entropy inequality? That's and then, so these are, these are the things I'm after. And for the momentum between layers here, yeah, uh, and the exchange of heat between layers, those are the ones. The rest, I already have everything that I had three-dimensional in terms of uh, stress-tensor relationship, uh, stress being pressure. It will all comes out in the lateral direction. Nothing would be new there. It's only these terms that are new. There is another additional thing here because I have the thickness, and the thickness is something can change. So indeed, uh, and then I said, okay, I only need it for two layers because if I can develop some exchange between these two layers, it's valid for other layers. I just use that. So this makes it simpler. And so that's why indeed I have for all phases within a layer and then for the two layers I am modeling. So, and then when you have two layers, one of them is exchanging on top with the outside world, that's my boundary condition. I put the flux in there, specify pressure, and the other one with the other outside at the bottom, so I have top and bottom boundary conditions, those are given, so the only thing not given is between them what happens. And that's what is being modeled here. So you get that and then, we get that the form, and then if this uh, time rate of change of temperature appears linearly here, for the non-equality to hold, this must be zero identically, which is what we had before. The same holds for the deformation rate tensor multiplying stress tensor, and then I have that uh, time rate of change of Helmholtz energy with density, that's, I identify that as pressure, this is now a pressure that is defined over the thickness because everything is defined over the thickness. It's one value. And the same for the solid can be related to the deformation of the solid. And then I have the time rate of change of porosity multiplying. This is also a sort of, this is also pressure actually. Pressure of phases, pressure of solid. So I come to this. Time rate of change of saturation, multiple of all kinds of other uh, energetic terms uh, for gas and for liquid. By the way, I wrote this for gas and liquid and solid. Time rate of change of uh, thickness. The velocity difference between phase alpha and phase uh, solid in the horizontal direction multiplies a number of terms and so forth and so forth. So if I look at this, some of these terms must go to 
to make sure that anthropic inequality will always, under all conditions, will be non-negative. And I also define equilibrium to be when there are no velocities, no gradient of temperature, no uh, rate of change of uh, the geometric properties. Also, the temperatures, oh, uh, sorry. Oh, okay, so uh, now this is theta one minus theta two. The temperature between the two layers must be uh, must be zero under the clip. It must be the same. Uh, so there's a minus sign there. Those are my uh, variables that must finish at uh, vanish at equilibrium. And so here are some equilibrium results. There is a solid pressure, which is the rate of change of free energy of solid with its own mass density. And these are pressures of the gases is is within the layer, and these are saturations. So we had this actually earlier for two-phase flow as well. So as I said, many of those are repeated. So at the equilibrium, solid pressure must be equal to that sum. Uh, we also get that at equilibrium, the liquid pressure minus gas pressure is equal to this sum of change of free energy, change of Helmholtz energy with respect to saturation. If you may recall the day from last week, for two-phase flow, I included interfacial areas. And then that difference is also a change of uh, free energy of interfaces with saturation. So I had more terms there. And I'll, today at the lecture, I'll talk about that. That is actually what is macro scale capillary pressure. Because I don't have interfacial areas, I don't have other terms. So anyway, uh, at equilibrium, the pressure, difference between the pressure of the two phases within the layer is related to something we call capillary pressure. So I ident identify this as capillary pressure now. This term here. But I do that not because uh, of, I mean, I can always define that as a definition denoted by symbol PC. But I know from the way we are doing measurements, also for a single layer, we have re been really measuring capillary pressure of a single layer. And the way we did it, we measured the gas pressure, water pressure in a container where the layer is put. And that difference we call capillary pressure. And we plot it as a function of saturation. So that's why I call this capillary pressure. And then we get something that relates, again, is, uh, pressure of solid to the change of free energy of the system as a result of the change of thickness. So that actually the source of pressure of the solid. Uh, what else do I get? I get that the exchange of momentum between phases and between a, a layer is related to all kinds of gradients of density and saturation. And the interesting thing is that it says that you can have a gradient in saturation. You can have a gradient in porosity and in uh, thickness and no flow. And we taught this discussion the other day that gradient in a saturation cannot cause flow uh, and or density uh, or the thickness. The layer being a little thicker there or there, there is a gradient, but it will not cause flow. It will cause a exchange of um, forces, but that at the equilibrium will be then balanced. Uh, we also get that the free ener the Gibbs energy, Gibbs free energy difference between two layers is zero because there is no exchange of mass basically, so the those must be zero. Now then we develop some non-equilibrium linearized results, and that is what I was looking after. The exchange of mass from layer, bottom of layer one to the top of layer two, because the sum was zero. If I go back to the entropy inequality, I see that that is 
multiplied here by this is pressure this is how most the energy change with density or with the volume the specific volume pressure of uh, layer two pressure of layer one that difference is running but also the difference between the free energies themselves so you notice that free energy plus pressure is gives free energy also if there are uh, flows then the difference in the kinetic energies can contribute to that and the difference between temperatures can contribute to the exchange of mass so if I linearize that I say okay under uh, a linearized condition this exchange is a function of its this is a flux and that's its driving force and the driving force is really the difference in between Gibbs free energies and the kinetic energies and the this is uh, internal energy but yeah is this useful can we model uh, formulate our governing equation in terms of Gibbs free energy we don't solve for Gibbs free energy in, in reservoir simulations for example so we really have to do something here and we have oh yeah then this is for the exchange of momentum it also has some equilibrium part and non-equilibrium part we had something similar to this for two-phase flow in general porous media and then what I do and if you have a non-linear a linear relationship for the non-equilibrium part of uh, this is resistances eh, between phases now I get similar to what I had before that that resistance is a function of for the alpha phase is a function of velocity of its its own phase so this is alpha with the solid and the other phase as well um, I by the way get the non-equilibrium uh, capillarity also that I have been presenting earlier and today I'll talk about this that the difference between the pressure of phases is equal to capillary pressure under equilibrium non-equilibrium that difference is proportional to saturation rate change uh, the exchange of heat from one layer to another layer is a linear function of their temperature difference this is motivated by the entropy inequality um, so if I put some of this equation in my momentum equation for a layer I get Darcy's law because this is del P but then del P horizontally planar then there is a gravity term there is a yeah, term related to gradient of saturation if I put this together I get gradient of Gibbs free energy and then uh, velocity term this is the resistance the inverse of permeability so you can you get it for layer one you get it for layer two there is an exchange between them and if you neglect all the extra terms you get Darcy's law in the horizontal direction okay big deal but that's how you could get it so horizontally I still have the, the standard two-phase flow equations yeah, it went too, a bit too fast for me I'm but sorry. what is then the constitutive equation perpendicular to the layers so, this so the, is what is the really being said here is that the momentum exchange momentum exchange mm -hmm. between the two layers I neglect that to get the flow horizontally the f yeah, the yeah, so this is clear uh -huh. but uh, you don't have any equation then for transport between the layers. I have between the yeah, masses. You had the exchange. Exchange of mass, yeah. yeah so here, uh, uh, the, here is the, the last exchange one of is mass. clear because that's yeah. the heat between the two, uh, exchange between the two layers. Exchange of mass? Yes. Okay. That is the exchange of mass. And so what else do you two. want? Because okay. yeah. uh, in fact, I have the mass balance equation. The equation I want to solve is mass balance equation. Yes. But and then in the mass balance equation, I have a 
velocity gradient horizontally, yes. and I have exchange of mass between layers. Yeah. For that, I have a formula between layers. Mm -hmm. And for the horizontal velocity, I get my Darcy's law. Yes, but the one equation you wrote for the, for the um, capillary pressure, mm -hmm. the S dot, yeah. that was for along the layer. Yeah, but uh, because capillary pressure and pressure are a scalar, it doesn't matter. At any given point of my layer, the pressure, there is one pressure defined for the gas, one pressure for the water, and a capillary pressure is defined under equilibrium condition, and the difference between them is regulated by S dot. So in any of the two layers, that equation applies in the point? That's correct, yeah. yes. So once again, please think of it that horizontally, I get the standard uh, two-phase flow equations. Standard, I mean, non-equilibrium capillary pressure you can put in. Uh, I didn't put interfacial area. You could put those interfacial area. In the horizontal direction, we don't get anything different. Darcy's law says that the velocity horizontally, if you neglect gravity, often yeah, these are layers put horizontally, it doesn't have to, then you should put the gravity back. Then it's just a matter of the pressure gradient in that layer. In each layer, there is a horizontal flow and it's a function of the pressure gradient horizontally. And then there is an exchange between the two layers and that is related to the difference in the Gibbs free energies, which then I go on to, so here is, mass balance equation now, that the saturation of a layer changes at any given point because water can move horizontally, this part, but because it can exchange mass with the upper and bottom layers. Now the top layer, as I said, in case of my case, is boundary condition, so that should be given. <coughs> and the exchange with the bottom layer I now have simplified it to the difference in the Gibbs free energy of the two layers. And then I go even one step further and I simply replace that with the pressure differences, saying that, yeah, the Gibbs free energy has a, a Helmholtz free energy part and a pressure part, and I find that only the pressure part assumed to be important. Is it a good assumption or not? Sometimes. It's a matter of uh, situations, but also let me apply it to a case where I do measurement, I do experiment, does this really help me to simulate those? So this is my two-phase flow equation. But you did have heat exchange also between Correct. the layer. So that depends on the, it's a function of the temperature difference between yeah. the two layers. Similar here, that is a function of the pressure difference between the two layers. I must say, uh, we, uh, today I will not talk about heat transport. We have one paper on that for fuel cells. Okay, so once again, this is the mass balance equation for layer one, and uh, if I put uh, the uh, Darcy's equation here. Now I have everything in terms of S and P1 and P2. So I have to write the same equation for layer 2, solve them together, and I still need an equation relating P2 to S2 and P1 to S1. PCS relationship I still need. I also need to specify what is this coefficient. So that's where the transition zone goes in, the, the interlayer space goes in. It goes all into here. And that itself would be a major research. How do you characterize the space between two layers? You could potentially model it as a third layer, and then write all of this for the third layer as well and then say, okay, physical layer one, space layer two, physical layer two, and then between these layers, you still have a transition zone. 
which then has no mass or no quality. So we try to model this experiment. So this is an experiment where, as I said, we put two layers of uh, uh, absorbing tissue. Uh, this is when there was no uh, pressure put on them. We had a case with, uh, the actually more interesting case is where we put pressure on them, bring them close to each other, because when we did the experiment for this, we injected water on top at one point. The water went horizontally. Nothing went to the lower layer, at least for the duration of 60 uh, many minutes of for God. hours no it was uh, much shorter uh, it didn't go look uh, a baby doesn't produce liquid for 60 hours this is <laughs> diaper how long does it take 30 seconds <laughs> okay 60 seconds so that's the what we are modeling so we then modeled this one uh, where you see it really this the space has disappeared but it has an effect. Okay, so this was the experimental setup. This is the, the two layers, the sample. We also did the experiment for a single layer of equal thickness, equal to two layers. Uh, this is the, then we put a plexiglass weight on it. In the diaper industry, they work with a standard, or all the experiments the study they do, a standard pressure of, they put a weight that gives a pressure of uh, 0.3 PSI. And I don't know why they work with PSI, but <laughs> that's what they do. So that's what this provides here. And then there's a hole in the middle, and through this hole, uh, we uh, put in a uh, saline liquid, uh, resembling urine, and then it's, uh, that liquid goes in, arrives here, start to spread both laterally and of course uh, over the thickness. There is a NMR device, nuclear magnetic res uh, resonance device that can uh, have, it has a sensitive window and that sensitive window can be zoomed in over this whole planar cross-section with a, uh, if I, I'm not mistaken, with a thickness or window of uh, 14 micron, and these were, how many microns? Can't remember. I think it was uh, three times, two times 300 micron, but then with the space between them, the overall thickness becomes bigger. So we could get 14 slices of measurement as a function of time, as the process was going on. So we get distribution over the layer of water, but then average over the plane of the layer. That's what we got. And we did these experiments with one layer of 86 GSM or two layers of 43 GSM grams per square meter. It's the density of it, that's how they signify. The, they were one by one centimeter in, in size. And uh, we also did it with pressure and under pressure, so above pressure. Okay, now we had already obtained, this was a whole study by itself, the capillary pressure saturation curves for these layers. Uh, there are lots of artifacts that are involved here that in usually capillary pressure saturation curves are simply not important. Uh, one question you can say, uh, how about if you measure the capillary pressure for one layer, or two layer, or five layer, do you get different results? And we say, okay, the results differences are not significant. Uh, the reason you want to do with five layers because these are tiny layers, 100, uh, 200 micron, 300 micron. So the amount of water that you are putting in and you want to regulate that in tiny amount going in and waiting until the equilibrium is so small that even the evaporation can affect uh, your result. Everything affects your result. 
I don't, uh, there is a whole uh, presentation I have about the artifacts that you have and how you should take care of them. Um, okay, so this is PCS scale. This was measured. Then we fit a van Gnuchten formula to this. And from there, we also get that relative permeability. These are the fiber contents uh, of the layers. These are two layers. You see that the fiber content is zero. Here it's non-zero because they, these fibers sort of intermingle and then go zero. One interesting question is what is the thickness of the layer? How do you determine that? Is that from here to here? How about if you put it between two plates and measure the distance between the two plates, but then these two plates uh, push all those fibers that stick out in there? Should we exclude them? Should we include them? What the thickness of the layer is, is not straightforward, actually. But anyway, so we, we modeled this whole thing. It's our modeling domain. Uh, as I said, there were 14. These are as shown as continuous. But actually, there are 14 data points put together to give me this. Um, and then this is the saturation distribution for a single layer, a thick one, uh, at the different times. 30 seconds uh, is this. So you see that saturation is really maximum in the middle. So there is a saturation distribution. By the way, it's heterogeneous. The layer is heterogeneous at the smaller scale, the lower scale. And then there is saturation basically follows that more or less. And it increases and about 100 seconds it reaches equilibrium. And I think also that's when we stopped injecting water. Uh, this is interesting, two layers. Now we don't have this, uh, say, well-behaved shape. At the beginning, nothing goes to the lower layer. This is the top layer. And then it starts to go into the uh, second layer. Interesting enough, in the space between them, the saturation is always lower. So at some point, you have more water in the two layers. Actually, now this is equilibrium. And there is, very, there is less in the uh, space between them. Uh, maybe not very strange, because uh, these are hydrophilic materials. So the water is absorbed by this hydrophilic material. And the space between them is a big space, uh, doesn't have any chance to hold the water in uh, competition with the hydrophilic fibers. So we did this modeling first three-dimensional. And to model this three-dimensional, we said, OK, we can do it three ways. One, we say one layer, another layer. Remember, I get PCS curve for this layer. That's the only thing I know. So I take this as a homogeneous layer. One homogeneous layer, another exactly homogeneous layer. I put them on top of each other. And when I model that, then there is no space. I mean, they are, I discretize. And then, yeah, the grids are continuous. So that's one. The other is say, yeah, but look, I can see here there is something different. So I make three layers. One homogeneous layer here, another homogeneous layer exactly the same as each other, and then a different layer in between them, and I assign some thickness that starts from here to there, middle of this to middle of that. And for this, I do have all the pore scale images. So we have this uh, geodict software where we can put images of pores into the software, and it will give us permeability PCS curve, relative permeability. So I construct that for this and uh, in, say, virtual layer. And the other one said, as I said, we had measurement over 14 points. So I say, OK, you know what? I give this to Geodict with all the uh, pore scale information of fibers I have. And I construct 
14 different PCS scales and permeabilities and so forth. So I have 14 layers. So these are the, now the, this is the best you can do, I would say, if you want to do three-dimensional modeling. And then for three-dimensional modeling, I have the Richards equation. Uh, I have a PCS relationship. This is sort of van Gunnachten formula. Based on that, I have router. This was measured, as I said. So alpha and M or N are fitted parameters, and I use them in that term. Now, these are the results I get. Uh, the, uh, the green is the experimental data at what time? 10 seconds. So this is the very start of the experiment. It says at 10 seconds, I have water only in the upper layer. Yeah, seems to be a little bit in the lower layer. The two subdomain model says water goes everywhere because yeah, it's homogeneous water. I showed you the experiment we did. You put the volume of water, it goes through in no time. Um, if you add that third layer with capillary pressure saturations relationship that are not uh, favorable for holding water. Now then it is still allows water to go through, but then it has a lower saturation and the saturation in the lower bottom layer is also less than in the top layer. But this is still the, the black is far away from green. And when you put 14 subdomains, you get a, yeah, more variation but it's still no, nowhere close to the green. But, uh, yeah, you could adjust uh, PC curves, I guess, for those in the middle layers and get a fairly good match. Good we did. I mean, this is this has its own PCS curve, definitely. But here, because it's a homogeneous layer, you you don't get any variation. Water comes in; it's everywhere. These are going to be flat, no matter. Okay. This, we really gave, I mean, you can maybe, yeah, first of all, it won't affect this, and then, yeah, you can affect this, we are making, bringing it lower, but then, what do you base it on? I get it from geodic, some poor scale simulation of poor space and then. No, in, in the three layer model, which the black squares, yeah, you get nicely constant in the first layer. Yeah, but then in the second layer you don't. You should also get it constant there. Oh, uh, here. Yeah. I think it has to do with the fact that the relative permeability here was pretty low. So. Yeah, but how how come that you have actually in the first layer you see that they're all the same. That because here you need very, very small pressure gradient to distribute the water. But, you know, you treat and here you need a pressure gradient. You, you treat it as a two-dimensional system. No, no, this is three-dimensional. Oh, you treat it as a... This is three-dimensional standard model. Three-dimensional homogeneous... Correct. Uh, okay, yeah, no, Correct. Then I, uh, no, no, it's three-dimensional. <laughs> but it should actually... The flat part of the black curve should be kind of the average of you should take the green curve, integrate it, and, and then spread it out so it is too low, that is clear. But what surprises me is why is the second layer in the modeling so much more absorbing than the experiment? This layer? Yeah, there. Yeah, because the interspace layer doesn't let water to go to the next layer. For the, remember, okay. you have a layer which is made of hydrophilic fibers. Yeah, yeah, no, I understand, but I mean, so the richer is not good. That's what you said. That's right. <laughs> but also the reason that the green data shows that very little water goes to the next layer mm -hmm. because for the water to enter that open space, mm -hmm you have to build up water saturation at the bottom of this top layer mm -hmm. before it can invade this open space. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's the wicking effect. Yeah. 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 That's why, I mean, this, 
I totally believe and accept the measured data. Exactly. But so Richard should be thrown out of the door. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes. So then we uh, looked at a later time. What is this now? Oh, yeah. So later time, 60 seconds. This was the end of the peeing uh, episode. Uh, and now you see that, well, as I said earlier, there is a lot more in the lower layer. The two homogeneous layer approach still gives me, yeah, the water is everywhere, the same saturation. The three layer with a virtual inter layer space gives me this one, which is still the same picture. The 14 layer approach doesn't really do a bad job now because we are approaching equilibrium. At equilibrium, the only thing that counts is PCS curve. All you need to know. And the flow processes are not important. You, so if you really, this means that we did a good job with Geodict to get the PCS curve for these thin, thin layers that we devised gets close to the, but it's still not for the lower layer because, yeah, interlayer space is not modeled well. And no. Okay. By the way, these are 14 uh, subdomains, but of course we had a lot more grid subs along the thickness to model each of these layers. Uh, so this, yeah, these are the ones. Now, then we use this reduced continuum approach, uh, which are the equations, again, is that basically this is Richard's equation, but then now it involves B. Uh, oops, this is porosity. I don't know why it became P. Uh, and then the exchange of mass between top and bottom layer. The, uh, the top exchange is the flux that I specify. The flux is zero everywhere else except the point of injection from top. At the bottom, the flux is zero because no, uh, for the duration of the experiment, no water left the bottom of the. So I have those. The only thing I don't know is this exchange between top and bottom layer, which I model by this difference in the pressure of the two phases. This is average, thickness average, uh, pressure. And then I have devised a, I have dreamed up an expression for the exchange coefficient. I have linked that and we have played with this in many ways, but actually what I have done here is to link it to the thickness of the two layers and to the you know, viscosity of water and density of water and uh, effective uh, permeability that involves intrinsic permeability and relative permeability. So unless water accumulates in the top layer to some, tar uh, some uh, threshold value, it cannot go to the next layer. That because the relative permeability is low. So now there are some other parameters here. Now, and then in order to compare my simulation to data, remember, this is only layered average. So I have to go and take my data and average over top layer and average over bottom layer. Because I only have average, layer average quantities from my uh, model that I can compare to data. So that's given here. The average saturation over the whole upper layer as a function of time. These are data. The average saturation at the bottom layer as a function of time. What you can clearly see is that there is a lag for the lower layer, bottom layer saturation to start increasing. And that corresponds to a saturation in the upper layer that is actually when the relative permeability has become large enough to allow water to, to move down. 
So that is what we call the threshold value, and that's an experimental number we, we got from here. These are the results of simulation using the Richards model with the 14 <coughs> homogeneous subdomains. I'm not even given the two layer or three layer. 14 homogeneous subdomains. This is the best I can do with Richards model. It's really far from this. It doesn't have any uh, threshold value and it's just like this. And the green is the top layer and this is the bottom layer. I use the RCM, the discontinuum model. That's my fit to the top layer and to the bottom layer. This was for the case of 30 microliter per minute. We did another experiment with half of this. And there is a lot more scattering in data because you have a really tiny, tiny amount of water you're talking about. And then we didn't change anything in parameter values. Nothing. All the parameter values, because note, there are parameter values. I must say, uh, there is a threshold value. These are all given from measurements, the relative permeability and the intrinsic permeability. There is a lambda here that we fitted and obtained. And then we fixed this and modeled the second experiment. No, it's not too bad. OK. And I think that's, uh, well, another interesting fact is that the co difference in computational effort was huge because we had there 25,000 elements and here we only had 150 elements. These are lateral, uh, two-dimensional elements. No, I think we just say that, okay. The thin porous media really 2D continua uh, we derived the governing equations using the thermodynamic approach. Interlayer spaces are not modeled as separate entities, but they are simply. See, the, uh, by the way, I didn't show the results. We did the case of two layers not compressed. Now, if you have two layers not compressed, there's a big space them. It's like you said there is no heat allowed. There is, we don't. The, the coefficient of mass section was zero. Yeah, nothing goes to the top layer. So this way it allows to model the those interlayer space, yeah, in a same way uh, uh, that we say model uh, other material properties. Uh, the governing equations are used basically similar standard simulation tools. We of course need to characterize that exchange time between layers. We came up with some uh, approximations and uh, we can get the properties from experiments. That's what we did. Uh, when you're looking or comparing with the Richard model here, in, in that model, basically all parameters were measured by imaging and simulation, right? So you don't really have any free parameters. Well, in your model, you're introducing a free parameter to control the uh, flux between the two layers, which could have been included in this first model, too. How do you do that in the first model? Because, well, uh, look, uh, I mean, well, you can have another first free all, parameter, right? Look, or you can, the, this is all coming from measurements. Because this in life should have been more explicit here. This is the combination of relative permeability and intrinsic permeability. Mm -hmm. They came from the same measurements that we use for Richard's model. Yeah, so they are also from these geodic calculations. So. No, no, these were measured. Oh, okay. We measured capillary pressure saturation curve for the layer and intrinsic permeability, I must say, at that time we have not measured it because we this were the, this experiment were done at Procter and Gamble uh, facility in Frankfurt. And later on, we brought the samples and devised a very nice way of measuring through plane and 
uh, in plane and through plane intrinsic permeability. So anyway, these were measured the same as there. Uh, what was an extra for the chart model is to use geodic to determine PCS curve for each subdomain. That was actually extra. We put a lot of you in a way extra parameter there. Lambda is uh, a fitting parameter. And then uh, because lambda will be zero if the layers are not compressed to each other. Because everything else is still finite. And this threshold value. And then, uh, yeah, so I don't know what we could put into Richard's model. Well, we can take a look at it together. I don't see really anything. Because Richard's model is, uh, everything is well defined. And what do you want to put in here? Well, you could change the constitutive relations for the intra layer. We did. We obtained the constitutive relations for it using geodic. Yes, but uh, you get an issue that, that you get too much transport between the two layers, right? And that could be adjusted by just adjusting. Yeah. Uh, Whatever you do, this is what you get. And for the two layers. For three layers, yeah. I don't know what you could do. You could reduce this, but then it's not predictive model. You just, each time you have to do the experiment, get the and data, the, the and then one free parameter which yeah, you are not yeah. able to measure. That's right. Yeah, that's but that's is somewhat what you have too, right? Because you have one uh, parameter you're not able to measure, which is the, uh, the transport between the two layers through this. But I still don't see what is it you want to put in here. You want to make the relative permeability very small here? Yeah, then there would be nothing going to the next one at all. Well, you can do it up to a certain saturation, for example. Yeah, I'm sure there are tricks. <laughs> because this, this is observed a lot when you're doing core measurements too. When they put plugs together, you are getting a much less transport than what you would sort of expect when they are sort of nicely put together and made with a filter. You would sort of believe you have a better connectivity mm. between them. But you do see that you're getting this issue quite often that you're, uh, yeah. It seems like the connectivity between the two, uh, two porous media are much but I lower than sort fair. of what you would expect. Yeah. I thought it's fair that I have the uh, yeah, poor skin image of everything. I give this to a code that in the past geodic has been used, we have used it, to reproduce PCS curves very nicely. I use that to give me a PCS curve for this domain. Yeah, and you see the PCS curve seems to work, right, when you're getting to the equilibrium yeah. condition. It's the, the next system. one, yeah. So it seems like it's, it's sort of the yeah, right except that in no, this... Yes. Yes. Ah. But at equilibrium, yeah. It thinks in equilibrium there are no processes really active anymore. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, I admit, I mean, there are ways to meet, tweak things. I mean, don't we do for many, many, many years reservoir modeling? where we make prediction and at the end of the year we go back and say, yeah, we have to change this and then until we're all set. Yes. But in the outset you started with saying that uh, it's impossible to, there exists no 3D model because you, have no, uh, you don't have the RAV in the vertical direction. But then you said, oh, if I divide it into small enough pieces and, and the, the defined properties, then I, but in, in, so one would not really expect that should it should not work. That's your group. and you and you prove it. Hmm? Yes, there, are, there is no R no three dimensional R. I fully really agree. Hmm? I wouldn't start the process in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> but let's say we say okay, well, let's try it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Or what else do I have? And uh, you can say the proof of the pudding is in eating. So okay, that's fine. <laughs> yeah. But I agree. Yeah. So that's basically what you see that. that uh... 
Okay, I think we should stop. It's past 11, and of course, I'll be fine with the great food talk. I must say, I'm not sure what I should talk about tomorrow, <laughs> okay. because we have another session. I think I've gone a little fast through many of things. Uh, in the past, I have talked about developing governing equations for watershed modeling where we follow the same approach and then divide a huge watershed into representative elementary watershed, REWs, not REVs. But I don't think we should do that. I don't think anyone doing surface flow modeling. So that's another application of this rational term dynamics approach. But so I don't know what to do tomorrow. Maybe we can have a session of discussion. I don't know. I mean, uh, <laughs> we don't have to. We don't uh, necessarily need to have a session. No. Okay. We are ex <laughs> exploiting you a lot. I think. Yeah. Oh, that's my pleasure. Seminars. I didn't know being exploited is can be so <laughs> pleasant. <laughs> it doesn't feel like it. You. Well, you know, this afternoon at one, you have another opportunity. To, uh, Okay. And then maybe we should just uh, stop this lecture. Okay. <coughs>